Uh, in video 37 of the Foundations of the Computational Economics course, uh, we will talk about uh, the theory of dynamic programming, so the theoretical foundations of uh, what we've been doing uh, in, the in the second half of the course so far. And uh, I will give an uh, overview of the solution methods. Um, I think it's about time that we take a broader look uh, at the collection of the models that we've been talking about and solving. So the plan is to uh, look at some classifications of dynamic models, the important things that we need to pay attention to, and the corresponding uh, uh, solution methods that apply to different formulations and different uh, variations of, them, of these models. And finally, I want to talk about contraction mapping and fixed points and all the theory that underlines the solution of the uh, infinite horizon dynamic problems. So we're thinking here about the general uh, general, general Bellman equation and general dynamic models. You know, trying to think of all of the examples that we've looked uh, at so far. Uh, as you remember, the Bellman equation is written with a value function, right, which is the function of the state, either, you know, this period state or next period state on the right-hand side of the Bellman equation. Uh, we are maximizing over decisions. The current reward may depend on the uh, current state and current decision uh, in the period. And then there is a continuation value which is discounted with a fixed discount factor beta. We need the expectation operator to, uh, to, to integrate over the random uh, components of the transitions uh, of the states. Uh, and that, of course, has to happen conditional on the states and decisions that we take today. So the states form a controlled stochastic process, uh, which uh, evolution depends on the actions, on the decisions that the decision maker is taking today. At least in the general, in the general formulation, right? Different models may have uh, um, different amounts of, of simplifications. But these are all the components of the model that uh, I, I want you to have in mind uh, as we uh, uh, follow uh, along this video. Right, so um, let's talk about various models and various problems that, that we've encountered so far. Um, so, you know, the very first examples, uh, there was no choice, uh, like the tiling problem. If you remember, uh, the, the problem was to calculate the number of ways to tile a particular uh, piece of uh, area, a particular rectangular, with uh, the tiles of particular size. Uh, in, in calculating this, uh, this, the, the, the number of, of the stylings, there, we just had to create a recursive formulation of the problem. And this is, um, uh, th these are the problems that computer scientists solve by backwards induction, right? Not necessarily it involves any sort of optimal choice. Now, in economics, we're more concerned with problems with choice because we want to model the optimal behavior of some economic agents. And so the problems, all the rest of the problems, essentially, uh, are uh, dynamic or also called sequential discrete or discretized choice that we've looked so far. The deal or no deal game, if you remember in video 27, uh, the inventory management where the choice was how much of new inventory to order in every period. Um, the rust model of bus engine replacement, the classical model uh, that we will continue talking about when we talk about the estimation of this uh, sequential discrete choice models. The cake eating problem where this the decision uh, of how much cake to eat was in principle continuous, but we discretized it uh, in a couple of different ways. Remember, you know, on grid using the coarse discretization based on the next period cake size or more fine discretization on the, on the independent grid. Uh, and then finally, consumption savings problem, which also uh, has a choice that is in principle continuous, but we've so far treated it in video 35 as a discrete choice as, as well. Now, um, problems uh, um, uh, may differ by the nature of choice, right? So I've already mentioned this several times. There, is, there are problems with uh, uh, discrete choice, and it's just discrete. Like, for example, deal or no deal problem, right? Whether you continue the game or you don't continue the game, that's inherently discrete. Inventory management with, uh, uh, with discrete uh, uh, inventory was also inherently discrete 
uh, a discrete choice problem, how many units to order. Some other problems are also inherently discrete choice, like for example, uh, shortest path problem problems or problems uh, in economics, like for example, when to re retire. You either retire or you don't retire, there's no continuity there. Uh, the the bus engine replacement was also an example of, of such problems, whether you replace the engine or you don't replace the engine. Now there are problems with continuous choice, of course, like cake eating problem or consumption savings problem, where we are deciding how much to consume out of a, uh, out of a, the wealth or the resources that we have in the beginning of the period, and that choice is continuous. Uh, um, now, we have so far treated this choice as not continuous, so we discretize the choice and solve the problem using some discrete grid. But we don't have to do that. We will be treating this choice as a truly continuous choice in the, in the next uh, several videos and see that uh, if we do that, then the accuracy of the solution of this model improves greatly. Um, now, uh, it is typical that if we treat, or if we are facing a problem with continuous choice, whether it's discretized or not discretized, we have to interpolate the value function when we are implementing the Bellman equation. Now, there are also problems with the combination of discrete and continuous choice. And these problems uh, that I've worked on uh, 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 in a couple of papers, these, pro this, these problems happen to be particularly nasty and difficult. Uh, the, uh, from the theoretical point of view. The, the value functions uh, have kinks, the policy functions have discontinuities, and these are the properties of this sort of uh, combination of choices. Now, from a practical point of view, uh, you know, discretizing all of these choices, both discrete, uh, well, discrete, already discrete, discretizing continuous choices to, to transfer this whole model into the discrete choice domain seems to be a practical way to deal with them. Of course, at the cost of losing some accuracy, as we already uh, got a feeling of, right? When we discretize continuous choice, then it's, uh, it's not easy to find the accurate solution. Now, what about the state space? Well, uh, if the choice is discrete, then typically sp state space is also discrete and finite. Like, for example, in the, uh, um, in the deal or no deal example or in the shortest path problems, the whole collection of problems that we actually didn't look at in this, in this, uh, in this series uh, of videos. Um, now, even if the state space is continuous, it's more often than not discretized. And this is quite typical. Uh, this is true in general. So when we are uh, um, applying numerical solvers, uh, and, you know, solve the problem on a computer, we usually discretize the state space uh, to begin with. And then we solve the problem, you know, point by point on the, uh, um, uh, um, uh, on, on, on the state, uh, on the state space. Okay. Uh, are there uh, any alternatives? Um, and what are the problems? Well, the problems are that we have to, every time, choose some upper bound uh, to be able to uh, define a grid on the, on the state space. And then uh, both the upper bound, the number and placement of the grid points actually influence uh, the solution and therefore they influence the accuracy of the solution as well. Another approach would be to try to approximate the value function, uh, uh, for example, using orthogonal polynomials and work in the space of these projections uh, uh, and not in the space of the function or represent this, the, the function space through these uh, um, uh, projections to the, uh, uh, to the sets of orthogonal polynomials. And this is not a bad approach if you know that your value function is, uh, is a sufficiently smooth function. But uh, going back to, for example, the combination of discrete and continuous choice, when we know that this is not true, then this approach may not be uh, ideal. Okay, um, various problems uh, uh, exist uh, when we think about continuity of time. Time can be discrete, like in all of the problems in this course, and then we have, um, then we have, you know, period t, time period t plus one, and we think about the problem evolving from uh, one time period to the next time period. The dynamics are given by the difference equations in this case. Now there is a whole class of problems. 
which are defined in continuous time. Uh, then all entries of the model are functions of time. The dynamics of the model are described by the differential equations. Uh, and therefore math is very different. The uh, principle of optimality holds, but it's expressed in a different way. Um, it is used in, uh, I would say it's used more in the uh, theoretical setups where uh, analytical solutions are available. Uh, and that's uh, often because continuous time does provide some cleaner theoretical models. But then, of course, they lack in the uh, um, in 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 how they relate to the complexities of the real life. So we are not looking at the continuous time problems at all in this course. Uh, if we think about time horizons, now is the very important distinction. Uh, we have finite horizon problems and the infinite horizon problems, right? I say here that most problems can be specified in both finite and infinite horizons. Which is true, although there are some inherently finite problems, like, for example, shortest path, uh, or, or that game of deal or no deal. Because there is a finite number of boxes to open, it, it's only a finite number of steps that you can take. But many other problems are representable in, in both finite and infinite horizons. So uh, just to uh, repeat, finite horizon means that there is a terminal period, usually denoted capital T, uh, the Bellman equation in capital T has a different form. In fact, it loses the continuation value. So the Bellman equation becomes just the maximization of the utility function. If there is no future, there is no discounted expected value to be added to it. Um, now, the value function and the policy function are uh, time dependent because uh, in each time period, we will have a different optimal uh, uh, mapping from the states, uh, possible states to possible actions. And the solution of the finite horizon problem is simply given by the backwards induction. There's no convergence here. Uh, it's just that we are starting from the capital uh, T period, the final period, and we solve the maximization and the Bellman equation backwards, you know, one period after another, taking the previous iteration solution into the current iteration solution. Uh, and that's, that's, that, that, in that case, this, this uh, formulation is much easier than the infinite horizon problem, where uh, the solution is given by a fixed point of a Bellman operator, right? So here we have to really solve a functional equation. We have to find the function uh, of value, the value function, uh, um, and the corresponding policy function that, uh, that satisfy the Bellman operator's fixed point condition. So we want to find the value function such that if we put it into the Bellman equation on the right-hand side, that's what we get on the uh, left-hand side as well. But on the other hand, time subscripts are dropped because everything becomes time invariant. Uh, and by everything, I mean all the entities of the model. Uh, and so it's only the next period that we have to worry about in the Bellman equation. And the next period uh, is traditionally denoted with primes. Um, but it's uh, the 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 point is that uh, uh, it's sort of it's less memory uh, uh, heavy, right? Because now we only have to remember uh, one instance of the value function as we iterate uh, uh, with our solution method. Oh, and and another thing to mention is that. Uh, you know, you may think that the infinite horizon problem, the solution method, say, by value function iteration, requires more iteration to converge to the fixed point. But that's not necessarily the case. Uh, uh, the number of iteration depends uh, very much on the parameters of the problem. First of all, the, uh, the, the beta, the discount factor, and also it depends on the solution method itself. There are methods which converge much faster than other methods. And so it could well be that solving an infinite horizon problem is easier than solving a finite horizon problem if the finite uh, horizon is, say, 100 years, like, uh, like it is typical in the life cycle uh, models, for example. Now, finally, it's important to think whether the problem is stochastic or not. Uh, in deterministic uh, models, there are no random elements, right? So all the motion rules are deterministic. It, you, you know with certainty uh, in which point of the state space uh, you will be tomorrow, given the, the point of the state space you're in now and the actions. 
And so there is no need for the expectation in the Bellman uh, equation, which makes it nice because then we don't have to worry about calculating any uh, weighted sums or any quadrature integrals or anything like that. On the other hand, stochastic models, uh, they come in several forms. So I specifically want to single out the stochastic models with the idiosyncratic shocks, like the Rust model of bus engine replacement or the stochastic inventory dynamics model in uh, exercise 11, uh, which uh, feature this uh, idiosyncratic shocks. Uh, that means that they are not uh, um, uh, dependent on their previous period realizations. And uh, that, that allows us to, uh, mm, to rewrite the problem in the expected value function space, right? And by the problem, I mean, I mean the fixed point problem now. So the Bellman equation with this, pro with this property of, uh, of, with idiosyncratic shocks, it can be rewritten such that the, the fixed point is formulated in terms of the expected value, uh, value functions. And then uh, it becomes a less dimensional problem to find that uh, fixed point. Um, yeah, and, and expectation doesn't have to be conditioned on the current period shocks by definition of of uh, uh, of idiosyncratic shocks. Now, but in general, you know, for both both about you know uh, stochastic models with idiosyncratic shock or uh, with the more complicated shock models. Uh, we have to uh, calculate the expectation in the Bellman equation. And uh, as we mentioned when we talked about quadrature, it's uh, uh, a really good approach for the low, dimensional, um, uh, low dimensionality of randomness, should I say. So uh, the quadrature uh, can be efficiently uh, used to calculate the integral, the expectation in the Bellman equation, when there are uh, two, three, maybe four dimensions of this randomness, but uh, if there are more than Monte Carlo integration is the way to go. Okay, so to sum up, uh, here are the questions to think about when you're talking about a dynamic model of any particular type. So this, this uh, specify the dynamic model uh, more or less completely. Discrete or continuous time, finite or infinite horizon, what is the choice space, uh, and then, you know, what what is the nature of the choices, what is the state space, uh, and what is the nature of that state space, uh, and whether the problem is stochastic or, or uh, deterministic. Knowing all of these, we can discuss what are the good methods and bad methods, or worse, or and better methods of uh, solving uh, every uh, any particular dynamic uh, model. And so, uh, here, if we start talking about uh, the, uh, the solution methods, uh, there are actually many more than what we've uh, encountered so far. So, let's start with, um, uh, with uh, a few distinctions. So, uh, as I say here, various type of models require different implementations and admit various solution methods. And by implementations, I mean sort of technical uh, numerical implementation of the Bellman operator, first of all. So uh, uh, whether the choice space is continuous, discrete, or mixed, state space is finite uh, or discretized, and whether there are shocks in the model, all of these influence, first of all, the, uh, how the Bellman operator is formulated and implemented. So for example, if you have idiosyncratic shocks, then Bellman operator can be formulated in terms of the expected values, whereas if you have more general uh, uh, stochasticity in the model, then maybe the Bellman operator is going to be in value functions, uh, uh, like usually, right? And then uh, uh, the implementation of the Bellman operator may require you to discretize choices or to treat them as continuous or uh, uh, you know, the state space can be represented by either uh, grids or these projections. Um, these, the, the, these factors, so, uh, therefore, influence the uh, details of the implementation more than the uh, solution method. The solution method, the choice of the solution method, is first of all influenced by the finite or infinite uh, horizon uh, nature of the problem, and then the choice space to some extent as well. So, uh, if the problem is finite, then as I said, the, uh, the main uh, solution method is just backwards induction. We're solving Bellman equation, 
sequentially from the terminal time period all the way to the first time period. And as we do so, we fill out this huge table of value functions. So I usually think of this as um, states and time. And so we start with capital T somewhere here. And then we go backwards and for each point of the state space, we solve uh, the value function uh, uh, for each time, uh, given time period. And, you know, because of the Bellman equation, then in each point here in this, you know, uh, previous time, it can refer to different values in the next uh, period, according to the Bellman equation. But as we go through the solution, uh, we sort of fill out this big table. And this is backwards induction. Now, backwards induction can be applied for uh, 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 to the first order conditions in the Bellman maximization problem instead of just sort of the optimization. So we can face it as an optimization problem or the uh, equation solving, where by equation I mean first order conditions. But it's pre pretty much the same uh, 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 solver in terms of complexity and, uh, and uh, the algorithm. Now, um, we will look in a few videos at the endogenous grid point method. This is a very powerful and very accurate method for solving particular problems, you know, the problems from a particular class. Uh, there is a finite version of the endogenous grid point method, and that would be applicable to the finite horizon models. If it is, uh, you know, uh, if, if the problem at hand is from the particular class that we, are, uh, that we will define and talk about later. Now, if the model is in infinite horizons, then uh, we have to solve the, uh, the fixed points. We have to solve for the fixed point. We have to solve the real functional equation. And therefore, the solution methods will be very different by nature, right? Uh, value function iterations, the method that we've worked so far, and I say here in all the, you know, videos from 28 to 35, so uh, all the solution methods, all, all, the, all, all the models that we've looked at, we have solved with value function iterations. And this is essentially successive approximation. If you go to, uh, to the corresponding video, I think it's number 22, where we just look at the successive approximations as a solution method. Well, we're doing solution, uh, we're doing successive approximations to solve for the fixed point of the Bellman operator. And this is what uh, value function iterations are by definition. Uh, now, there is a, another approach. Uh, we can uh, 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 apply a method of what's called time iterations. And this is a, essentially a successive approximation um, to solve for a fixed point in a different operator. Not the Bellman operator, but what's called kalman raffet operator. Uh, uh, this applies to the uh, models with continuous uh, choices, continuous choice space such that uh, we can write the first order conditions for these models. And then uh, the first order conditions define the operator, this uh, kalman referent operator, in policy function space. So time iterations correspond to the uh, uh, solver of the first order conditions in the, fi in the, in the finite horizon uh, uh, case. All right. Um, now there is a separate method which uh, which is like uh, expectation maximization algorithm, which is called policy iteration or Howard's policy improvement algorithm. This is an iterative solution for the fixed point of the Bellman operator, and the iterative here has a special meaning. Uh, it iterates between uh, uh, finding a, a policy that uh, maximizes a particular expected value and then re-evaluating the expected value given the policy. So it goes sort of instead of solving the whole, uh, um, the whole fixed point problem uh, as it is, it approaches sort of part by part. Now the fourth method, which is called newton kantorovich uh, method, uh, is an alternative to the value function iterations in the sense that it applies the Newton solver to the fixed point uh, uh, equation of the Bellman operator. So uh, remember, we have to find the fixed point of the Bellman operator to solve the problem. And the value function iterations is uh, the go-to method, which is uh, globally convergent. We can start it at any point uh, and we will uh, find the solution. The problem is, you know, how long it will take. Now we can rewrite this fixed point condition of the Bellman operator as a simple equation. 
And if that is an equation, well, in fact, that's going to be a, a, a system, a pretty large system of nonlinear equations. Then we can uh, apply a Newton solver to that equation or a system of equations. And the idea, which is based on this application, gives uh, rise to the Newton Kantorovich method, where Kantorovich uh, um, uh, um, generalized the, the, Newton, the Newton approach to the uh, functional spaces, essentially. Finally, the endogenous grid point method, which, as I said uh, already, applies only to particular problems from a particular class, uh, uh, is, uh, has been first developed for the infinite horizon problems. Uh, and so it applies here directly. We will look at this. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful, it's sort of like a, a magic method. Unfortunately, only applies to uh, certain problems. All right, so next I wanted to talk about the convergence of the solution methods in the infinite horizon uh, uh, models. You've noticed probably that all solution methods, uh, you know, uh, iterate until some convergence. And, and this, this is true, all of this, all of this method, the value function iterations, the time iterations, the policy iterations, and newton Kantorovich iterations, and also the endogenous grid point method. They uh, repeat a particular iteration uh, as many times as it takes to achieve convergence uh, in, a, in, in the corresponding space. Um, and, uh, well, the, the, you know, this is natural because in Infinite Horizon, the solution to the dynamic model is characterized by some sort of fixed point condition. So how can we, we be sure that the algorithm, the solver algorithm would converge? Uh, and uh, I would like to talk about this now specifically and address the, uh, uh, this particular question. So the question is answered within the theory of contraction mapping. It turns out, as a summary, that Bellman operator is generally contraction mapping. And that means that the Banach theorem uh, applies and it guarantees uniqueness of the fixed point. This is uh, the fixed point of the Bellman operator is our solution that we're seeking. So we have a guarantee for the uniqueness of this uh, fixed point and moreover, uh, successive approximation then work. Uh, and because it's unique, the successive approximations are globally convergent. And that again means that we can start the uh, solver from any point anywhere in the space and we are guaranteed to converge to the unique solution. This is very powerful, but unfortunately not fast uh, um, all the time. So here's the definition of contraction mapping. Uh, if we have uh, a complete metric space uh, where uh, uh, S denotes the, uh, 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 the uh, set of elements in this space and rho denotes the norm, and we have a mapping from S to S, uh, this is an operator which maps this uh, uh, set S to itself. Then this operator is called a contraction uh, on S with uh, a modulus lambda, where lambda has to be strictly less than 1 and greater or equal to 0. When the following condition holds, right, for any two elements in S, if you measure uh, the distance between them, uh, and then you measure the distance between the uh, um, images of the operator or the operators applied to them. So the, this is the distance uh, uh, of the uh, uh, operator applied to each of the elements. Then this inequality has to hold. And in essence, what, what this means is that if you take any two elements in the, in the set and then apply an operator to each of them, then these points somehow be get together. You know, it, they, 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 it, they're brought together by the operator. And if that's the case, then the operator is a contraction mapping. So I thought that we could get a feel of this contraction mapping operator using an extremely simple problem. Uh, this is the example of the problem uh, which can be solved by dynamic programming, but it does not have any choice. So this is, this is one of those computer science dynamic programming uh, solvable problems. But it is economics. So um, we have a stream of payments here. We want to pay V uh, today. And then starting from tomorrow, we're going to get the equal payments for, the, for, for eternity, forever. Uh, this is S's. So we're talking about an annuity here. Uh, imagine that the interest rate is R. Uh, the question is, what's the value of annuity? What's the value? What's the fair price for this infinite stream of identical payments? 
All right. Well, we can write down the uh, the net present uh, value of this stream, and we should discount by one plus r. Uh, and if I denote beta to be one over one plus r, then we can see that this is a geometric series. Uh, uh, well, this is just shorthand notation. But since this is a geometric series, then we immediately have the solution, uh, which is given here. Right. So it's just dividing by one minus beta of the single payment, which gives us the value of the whole stream. Uh, so it's extremely simple problem. Why would I bring it up? Well, see, uh, we could uh, take one of these betas out of all of the payments uh, in the sum, starting from the second element. And then we could recognize that what's in the brackets here is just exactly the same as V itself by definition. So we have this recursive formulation for V, which equals C plus beta V. And that resembles the Bellman equation, right? It resembles the Bellman equation where there's no choice, so there's no max over actions, but C is like a current reward, and beta is the discount factor, and then V is like a value function, except value function has no arguments in here, which is also kind of convenient because then it's easy to measure distances between these functions. We're not in the functional space anymore. This is sort of like a Bellman equation in R1. V is just a number and this V is just a number, but they represent the functions that we would be talking about in the Bellman equation. So is this a contraction? Uh, we have the operator T of V, that's like, you know, quote unquote Bellman operator, which takes the value V and returns this uh, a linear transformation of V. Let's just check whether this is a, a contraction or not. So imagine there are two uh, different values for V, V1 and V2. We can uh, just write the absolute value for the distance between the, um, the images of these two points uh, returned by the operator. Uh, you know, simplest algebra gives us uh, the equality with beta uh, times the absolute difference between the points themselves. So uh, this does satisfy uh, this definition here. And it satisfies this definition with the Euclidean norm and the modulus beta. So if beta is between zero and strictly less than one, then we have a contraction mapping that defines V, which is in this case, just a scalar that corresponds to the value of the annuity. So uh, we could do successive approximations then, right? We could start with any value, say zero, one, or whatever, doesn't matter, and then just insert it into the Bellman operator and uh, uh, around the value function iteration algorithm. So they apply the, uh, you know, build a series of approximations with I denoting the iteration uh, index. And we can start stop that when when we converge. So the difference, the the absolute difference between these two, gets smaller than some small number. So here's the simple code, uh, which is a class annuity. We have annuity payment and beta, and I'm just going to code up the analytical solution right away so that we compare to it. The Bellman equation is extremely simple. It takes v, and returns this uh, self c plus beta v using the parameters of the model. And the solver is, uh, is our usual successive approximation solver, here written uh, uh, without the callback because it's so simple, but with some verbose uh, verbosity for output. Uh, and what it does is basically applies Bellman uh, uh, to the V0 and then updates before the next iteration in the, in the max eater iterations. So you should be uh, able to recognize this solver immediately. All right, um, let's set up a problem and uh, uh, solve it. Analytical solution and numerical solution, see they are not very far, but quite far still. Uh, so can I increase the, uh, the tolerance? Here we go. Now they are almost identical. Well, they are, they are different, but in, you know, very far after the decimal uh, point. What's more interesting is that if I turn on the verbosity here, uh, what it prints is, um, uh, you know, you can go back and verify it in the code. What it prints is the, uh, the current value of V, 
uh, and we are starting. Okay, let's let's verify together. Uh, so we are we are printing <coughs> the iteration number, the updated value v, and then uh, the difference between v and the analytical solution. So iteration value and error. Now, the error is the error is calculated with respect to the analytical solution, and we know that the analytical solution is the fixed point, right? That's by definition the fixed point. So that's if we are uh, checking the definition for contraction mapping, where one of the elements is the fixed point itself, and so it just doesn't change as we apply Bellman operator over and over again. So the error in this case uh, tells us the difference between two consecutive. I'm sorry, the difference between each of a series of consecutive approximations to the fixed point, which doesn't move. And look at this, as, as iterations, as the solver progresses and iterations go further and further, we have this absolutely monotonic decrease in the error, in the error uh, uh, between the two elements, again, one of which is fixed, so it doesn't move, but the other does. And uh, so this is a numerical a check for the contraction mapping property. That's what it is. And you can see that the error decreases uh, as we solve the problem. Now, uh, what would uh, influence the uh, speed of convergence there? Let me make beta uh, really sl uh, small, okay? And let's run this again. Oh, we converged to 19 iterations. Well, two given tolerance, of course. And that's also quite uh, uh, clear, right? Uh, because what we have here is that the difference between the uh, um, the difference between the um, uh, uh, um, the approximation. So imagine v two is the solution. So v two and, and t of v two is the same thing, and that's against what we compare. That's the fixed point. So this is one iteration v, and this is the next iteration. The error for the previous iteration compared to the error of the next iteration, you know, the, the ratio is given by beta. This is by definition here, and more generally it will be bounded by beta in, in the more general case. But we are, but here if we take the, the ratio of this error to this error, uh, we will see that the ratio will simply just be beta all the time. And therefore, beta is the factor of speed of convergence. So if I take beta really close to one, uh, no convergence, more maximum number of iterations achieved. Okay, so we need to uh, we need to give it more max iter. A uh, hundred thousand? No, ten thousand? No. Okay, that's probably uh, that's uh, the tolerance is too low. Okay, let's increase the tolerance. I just want to see whether I can achieve the convergence. Here's convergence with quite low tolerance. So if I want to increase the tolerance now, because that should be fixed. Okay, here we are. Um, and let me repeat that with, uh, with an output. How many iterations? See, the difference between these errors now is very is declining very slowly, because the uh, the ratio between the two consecutive errors is almost one, right? Oh, it's going to take me a lot of, a long time to scroll down. But you can see it took twenty five thousand iterations now, to uh, to converge, and uh, the error almost doesn't change here. It's impossible to see. So it changes by a very tiny amount because of that uh, uh, modulus of contraction, which is very close to one. Okay, um, uh, so going back to the uh, um, to the general case, uh, the main result that allows us to uh, apply value function iteration is called the Banach contraction mapping theorem or fixed point theorem, and it states the following. Uh, if we have a complete metric space with uh, 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 a set of elements S and a norm rho defined there, and we have a contraction mapping on that space, uh, then that's all it takes, right? Then, uh, then T admits a unique fixed point, uh, denoted here V star, 
So if it is a contraction mapping in a complete metric space, then uh, uh, there is a unique fixed point already. And then this fixed point can be found by repeated applications of the operator and mathematically can write it so that the, the operator to the power, so applied many, many times uh, to itself, converges to V stars and approaches infinity. Um, oh, there are some errors here. So in other words, Uh, uh, in other words, the fixed point theorem guarantees the uniqueness of the solution uh, for the f infinite horizon problems, dynamic problems. Uh, uh, and then it also gives us this successive approximation method for finding the solution, <coughs> which is essentially uh, the value function uh, iteration. So what about the Bellman operator? I've mentioned already that it happens to be contraction mapping in general. Um, let's think about the Bellman operator again as in the most general uh, form. Uh, it, uh, uh, it is applied uh, to the V functions, which are functions of some uh, state variables. It enters into the right-hand side of this, exp uh, of, this, uh, of this expression, the whole expression, and then this, this is what's returned, right? What's returned is calculated by this, by this whole maximization. So the Bellman operator operates in the functional space. It goes from U to U, and we usually use the uniform or subnorm uh, to measure distances between functions. You can think of this as the maximum absolute distance between the functions for all of the points where they are defined. Okay? Well, uh, it, is, it is so that by Blackwell, a sufficient condition for contraction that the Bellman operator uh, 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 constitutes a contraction mapping. And so let's look at this. Uh, if we have an X, which is a subset of Rn, and uh, Bx uh, is the space of all bounded functions on F, which go from X to R to the, uh, to the real numbers, um, and we have some operator that goes from B of X to B of X, and uh, imagine now that this operator satisfies the following two conditions. So first of all, it's a monotonicity condition. So for I uh, every two functions, uh, g and x, uh, f and g, uh, in this uh, space, b of x, if we have that g of x is uh, less or equal g of x for all x, so the, you know, one function lies below the other one or not above the other one, uh, that would imply that the uh, images, you know, after the operator is applied, uh, uh, maintain this inequality. That that's called monotonicity. And then discounting is uh, is is the following property: if we apply an operator to the function uh, which had been shifted by a constant, okay, up or down, then the following inequality should hold. Uh, there is a typo here. Beta A should be like this. Um, so the following inequality should hold. It's the operator applied to the function itself plus beta, al uh, beta times the constant, uh, constant A. And so if this holds for all functions in the B of X and for all possible A's uh, and for all elements of X, for some beta between zero and one. Now, so if these two conditions hold, then we have T as a contraction mapping uh, with modulus beta. And uh, this is a very useful, this is very useful uh, conditions. Uh, you can think of, of this form as resembling the Bellman uh, operator, right? With beta times something. And indeed, uh, it is very trivially, uh, uh, it is very trivial to check that both the monotonicity and the discounting is satisfied. For discounting, we have to have beta uh, strictly less than one. Uh, and the monotonicity um, is essentially applied to the uh, to the uh, um, uh, value function, right? That appears under the expected um, uh, under the expectation uh, uh, operation in the Bellman equation. And of course, you know, if the functions is, is all uh, is uh, there is there is a relationship, the inequality between functions that it carries through. So with additional uh, boundness condition that, that we need for the Blackwell uh, 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 sufficient conditions to hold, Bellman operator is a contraction mapping, okay? And so this, this usually holds, 
Uh, and then we have, uh, uh, altogether, we have uniqueness of the solution of the fixed point equation, of the fixed point of the Bellman operator. And uh, by the Banach theorem, the fixed point theorem, we have both uniqueness and the, uh, the algorithm to find that unique solution, the value function iterations. What's, what's also interesting is that, you know, this, uh, this theoretical um, properties, they do not uh, depend on the numerical implementation of the Bellman operator. Of course, as long as we uh, don't have bugs in the code, essentially, right? Uh, and uh, mm, I imagine there are ways to uh, break uh, uh, the monotonicity or the discounting property in the black walls conditions if the numerical implementation is not accurate enough. But uh, generally, uh, the results do not depend on the numerical implementation. And that means that uh, it doesn't matter whether we discretize choice space or, or state space, or we treat choices as continuous, or we do some fancy tricks like in the endogenous grid point method. Uh, the same theory applies in the existence of the unique fixed point the existence and uniqueness of the fixed point of the Bellman operator still holds. Uh, now, uh, not only uh, the uh, trivial example on the value of annuity and most of the Bellman equations that we looked at uh, um, are contraction mappings. For example, the Markov chain stationary distributions that we found by uh, a repeated application of the transition probability matrix. That's also a contraction. Uh, remember the example with platform market equilibrium uh, in video 22, and in fact, all of the examples for the successive approximation solver uh, were also contractions. In fact, successive approximation uh, as a solution method works uh, uh, um, for uh, works very well for the contractions because then it becomes uh, globally convergent. Doesn't matter where you start, uh, but. Uh, if uh, some operator is locally uh, a contraction, right? So it's only in those cases that successive approximation can find that locally stable solution. So contraction and stability is, uh, is a, are the related properties. Now, uh, the question is then, you know, given all this nice theory, uh, and again, the, the, the nice theory tells us that VFI can solve any problem. Why do we need other algorithms? Well, it turns out that, um, uh, it may not be a very good solution algorithm, even though it is guaranteed to find the solution. Uh, uh, and um, so it's worth mentioning that time iterations is, uh, has the same linear convergence as the value function iterations, uh, but there are algorithms that converge faster to the solution. And especially in bigger problems, it may very well be a good idea to, f to use a faster algorithm to algorithms to, s to find solutions. And uh, then of course, Newton comes to mind and this is where Newton-based based algorithms, uh, the newton kantorovich method uh, comes into, the, in, into, the, um, into our consideration as, uh, as a very fast method, which would be especially useful for those betas very close to one. And even though it's not globally convergent, we may start, we may apply, say, VFI or some other global algorithm to find the good starting value. And then, uh, you know, poly algorithms is going to be a good idea. Okay, this is still to come in the next videos. But so far, uh, there are some nice uh, uh, learning resources, the videos that uh, uh, give you a bit of a crash course in, into Benak spaces and a really nice one on the fixed points in real, uh, you know, everyday life. All right, see you in the next uh, video.